Hey guys, new video time again. I hope you're all enjoying tournament season because I just won a store championship. And how's it taste? It's delicious. Still doesn't help me get a date though. Anywho, a new pack means new cards to talk about. This is Down the White Nile. Why is the Nile white? Probably because it's made of ivory. If you didn't get that reference, it's because you didn't play Iconoclast and you're scientifically wrong. Give that game your money. Anywho, let's start this pack up with Acacia. This is a one to play, one influence Anarch hardware. Whenever the court purges virus counters, you gain a credit for each virus counter removed and then trash Acacia. So this is basically a reverse version the reverse version of fester whereas fester made the corp lose money when they purge this one makes you gain money uh, which is obviously got to build around it but it could have a lot of potential uh, one thing this pack is definitely gearing up towards and the cycle in general is gearing up towards especially with the next card in line is a whole bunch of mechanics based on how many virus counters you have so there's going to be lots and lots of reasons to stack a bajillion virus counters, and this is one of them. So this card alone is a good reason to put out more than one data sucker at a time. Uh, if you've got something like a turtle and two data suckers and whatever the hell else you have on the field and the court purges, they may set you back with the power of your turtles and whatnot, but you can gain, what, 10, 15 credits from that easily? It just makes the tempo swing of the court passing their turn even more in the runner's favor, because normally the court tries to purge to stop effects and slow the runner down. This achieves that, but also gives the runner a huge tempo boost. You know, whereas compared to Fester, Fester would eventually not matter if the court was so broke that they couldn't pay for anything anyway. But, yeah, I think in the, in the coming uh, virus counter stacking decks, this will be a key card. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes, but we'll probably see this relevant soon. After that, we've got Plague, which is a 2 to install, 1 MU to influence virus program, and when you install it, choose a server. Whenever you make a successful run on the chosen server, you may place two virus counters on Plague. And, well, there's not really a whole lot to say about this one. It's a gigantic virus counter battery. That's... That's it. It's a gigantic storage pile for virus counters. Uh, it's not unique. You can have multiples of these down and run different servers. It's every time you hit that server, not just the first time. So the, against any open asset deck, you can just pile. You have two, against any asset spam deck, you have essentially infinite virus counters because you can gain eight a turn. I mean, it's it's simple. It's straightforward, and it's it's just a gigantic virus counter battery. So. Like, what else you want me to say about it? All right, then for Krim, we've got Credit Kiting. This is a three influence, zero to play event. Play only if you made a successful run on a central server this turn. Install a card from your grip, lowering its install cost by eight credits, and take one tag. So this one's kind of interesting. It's kind of a, it's kind of a supercharged version of like Career Fair or Modded. Uh, obviously, the discount you get is much, much larger, but it also has more restrictions. Uh, like, you have to have made a run on a central server, you also have to take a tag, which I'm not entirely sure what the point of the tag is, other than to keep things from being completely free. It, do it can install any card from your grip. That's very important that it can install any card, but obviously when a criminal player looks at this, the first thing they're going to think is Femme Fatale. This is absolutely a good way to install your Femme Fatale for essentially two credits, sorry, three, three credits instead of nine. So that's pretty good. I'm not sure specifically off the top of my head what things are prime targets for this. Uh, you would probably want something that costs like at least six credits to install, because uh, you still have to take the tag. Even if you can install something for six for free, like a maw or you splashed in or something, you still have to take the click and two credits to remove the tag. 
So like I would, I would the good target for this was something that would be something that costs like at least six, I would say. But in that scenario, it's pretty solid. I mean, this combos very very well with Dirty Laundry, of course, because lots of Crim cards combine well with that. Uh, it's good for getting big fat breakers out, but again, Crim's most for for the moment that only applies to Femme Fatale really. Uh, the, however, if there's any other big fat breakers that you want to put out. Uh, they, it, this card also combos with uh, special order, because in one turn you can make a run on a make a run on a server, special order the fem or whatever to your hand, third click play this, fourth click remove the tag, and that's your whole turn. But you get to make a run and install something huge for not very much money. So again, I I think in order to use this card well it takes a much deeper look through the card list. I'm sure someone, could, well, you're going to see people trying at this out with Femme Fatale, but off the top of my head for Crims, there's not a whole lot of other great targets for this. Uh, so we'll see We'll see what happens, but this definitely has the potential to be a good, like, tempo pseudo-econ card, like another type of career fair card. So I, I'm, you're probably not going to see it used on much else besides Femme early on, but... I don't doubt someone will figure out something better to do with this besides just Femme Fatale. Anyway, we'll interested interested to see where this goes. And after that, we've got a weird little program called Wari. Uh, so it's, it's one MU. It's one to install. It's four influence. It says the first time you make a successful run on HQ each turn, you may trash it to name Sentry Code Gator Barrier. Expose a piece of ice, then add it to HQ if it has the name subtype. So this is clearly another card preparing for the coming of 419, because this is yet another card that gives you a really nice effect, but only if you already know the answer to the thing you're naming. Because uh, like, what was that other one called that gives you money if you guess right? But yeah, this is this is another card that becomes substantially more effective if you don't actually have to guess. Also, if you have 419's effect, where you already know what type of ice it is, or if you've derez that piece of ice previously, uh, then you can use this and return that ice back to their hand. Which is, it's a nice little bonus effect to have, but honestly, I don't see why you would take up MU for this, uh, especially outside of 419. So, it's, it's a nifty little card, but I don't think we're going to see very much of it, just because... Yeah, you, even in even in four one nine, there's probably better uses for your MU. If it didn't, if this didn't cost an MU, if it was just like a trashable resource or something, I would probably consider it a lot better. But for how pre for how precious runner MU is, you're probably going to want something a little better than this. It feels it feels kind of crescentious e, but again, like unless you're four one nine, you have to guess. So maybe he can get good use out of it. But again, like uh, Zamba, I'm not seeing. A ton of effective use for this outside of its clearly intended ID. All right, next up for shapers, we've got a shiny new identity that everyone's really excited about. This is Kabune Wu, who is a character from the Red Sand Cycle. If you remember that, uh, she's a forty-five fifteen. She's got one link. She's also got apparently those little peridot floaty finger things. Uh, but her ability is click, search your stack for a non-virus program and install it, lowering its install cost by one, then shuffle your stack. If that program is still installed when your turn ends, remove it from the game. So there's a lot of nonsense you can do with this, and it's she, she's, she basically has a modified version of self-modifying code on a stick as her ability. And in a, like, in a way, uh, this stack... Or this this ID does something that shapers are typically really good at, which is being able to summon programs and use SMC and instant install. This is an instant, but to summon silver bullets out of your deck uh, whenever you need them. Although with this one, they'll be removed from the game afterwards. So this she's definitely very good at uh, plucking out programs that you want when you want them. You basically always have a self modifying code effect, and of course her ability can summon self-modifying code which when you you which you, you when you then use self-modifying code the program you bring in with that doesn't get removed 
and in fact the self-modifying code just stays in your bin. So the big thing about using this identity is finding ways to sneak around the remove it from the game clause. That's, pre that's pretty much the entire point of this, char of this character's ability is be being able to tutor anything you want out of your deck for a slight discount and then figure out a way to cheat out of the remove it from the game effect which you can't use you can't use satcon for that cuz satcon doesn't prevent remo removal uh, but you can use scavenge scavenge 100% works to keep the program from being removed so the, every every single Cabernese Wu deck, every every single Lady Carbonara here, is going to have three scavenges in it. Because if you don't do that, you're wrong. And there's there's a couple other car things you can do. You can obviously just install SMC. You can install a program and then install another program over it, and then clone ship it back out later, or or use test run. There's there's a lot of things you can do, but I think rather than rather than just having the extreme consistency of being able to summon stuff out of your deck, because one thing she does do is give you a 100% chance of having a turn one magnum opus, no matter what. Uh, but besides having the extreme consistency, this character also lets sh lets shapers set up extraordinarily fast, and that's kind of kind of sort of against what shapers normally do, because usually shapers are the slow to start late game monsters. They're, they usually have the hard lock on the late game. Kabane Sawu having the SMC on a stick and it means as long as you have some burst econ to set up, you should be able to set up faster with her than any other shaper in the game, which means she could very much be used as a anti-rush ID, which would be really interesting. But yeah, she's got a link. She can run Underworld Contacts. There's, yeah, there's there's definitely going to be a lot of people experimenting with this ID, and I'm probably going to be one of them. Uh, there's definitely more to her. Got it. There's definitely got to be more to her than just put scavenge in your deck. So we'll so we'll we'll see what people come up with with her. But I'm thinking what she's going to end up being is either a, either a silver bullet machine or. So, or just a, or just you, or just used for her extremely fast ability to set up to set up her rig. So yeah, there's def definitely potential here. After that, we've got Takogi, which is a unique program. It's one MU. It's two to install, and it says sorry three influence, and it says whenever you break all subroutines in a piece of ice during a single encounter, you may place one power counter on it. Two power counters choose a non-AI icebreaker. That icebreaker has plus three strength until the end of the current encounter. So this one's a little awkward, but it should be looked at as like a pseudo econ card of sorts. Because this this clear well, this clearly belongs in a very aggressive deck that runs lots of times uh, to get its effect the most often. Uh, it also Essentially, just saves you money on boosting breakers. So it's so assu assuming that all your breakers are one credit for one strength to buff. Then what this basically says is every two times you get through a piece of ice, you get three credits that you can spend specifically on boosting a breaker the next time you run into a piece of ice, which situationally can be really really good. Uh, a, of course, you have to be running constantly. You have to be running very regularly uh, for this to be worth it. But it can potentially save you a buttload of money. And, of course, this also is situational in the fact that the stronger the corpse ice, the more useful this is. Obviously, if the corpse is running a bunch of cheap gear checks like Vanilla and Enigma and stuff, then this is near worthless. But if the corpse is running a lot of bigger stuff then this could have a lot of use. So the, the, the fatter your corpse ice is, the more useful this is. Uh, there's also the fact that this works with, this should work with system seizure, so that the free plus three strength uh, stays for the run, in case that, in case that ends up being relevant. So it's a, it's a, it's a nifty card, and I do kind of like it. It kind of helps you, like, if you're, if you're already, if you already have good, tempo rolling, it helps you keep that rolling and not 
and not burn out nearly as fast. But because of the like situationalness of it, you're probably not going to see a lot of it, uh, especially because it takes up an MU. But I, I wouldn't, I would not object to trying this card out. It looks like it could be pretty fun. All right, then last for Shaper, we've got Kongamato, Kongamato, Kong Tomato. I know they'll probably just get named Pterodactyl or something. Uh, it's one credit, one influence resource. It is virtual, uh, and it says. Trash it, break the first subroutine on the encountered piece of ice. So this honestly feels an awful lot like a criminal card. I'm actually really surprised this is green and not blue. Because it's, it's, it's cheap, it's fast, it's aggressive, uh, it's kind of like a uh, tracker or a grappling hook. Uh, so yeah, I'm, re I'm really surprised this is green and not blue. But then again... Uh, Maybe it would be interesting to splash some of the only one influence, splash some into blue, like this plus tracker. And when you've got things like inside jobs and whatnot, it should be very good at uh, getting through or uh, getting through early game and stealing agendas, even when you don't have breakers out. Uh, and I think that uh, this this plus Takobi plus Kabune Sawu, uh, I think these three cards all together are probably intended to encourage that strangely aggressive shaper archetype that I was talking about. Uh, like, set up set up really fast with Ka with Kabanesa, get Takobi down so that you can start building up counters on it quickly and keep your tempo rolling. Uh, use, ter use Pterodactyl here to get through any gear check, any, any one sub ice, any gear check ice, and just Start out fast and hard, and try to keep your tempo rolling as much as you can. It's a very, it's a very crim mindset, but it's a yeah. This this card is clearly meant to get through uh, any cheap one sub gear checks, or really well any any one sub ice period. So I mean, against Enigma, it just keeps you from losing the click, but it'll get you through Vanillas when you don't have a fractor down. But this can this can also screw over. A fair amount of the more expensive ice too. Like this gets you through touring. This gets you through firewall. There's there's a decent number of stuff that this will help you through. Now, do I do I expect to see this card very much? No, I don't. But it's 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 an interesting card that could see a little bit of use in a very very early game. Take the tempo, ride the tempo to a fast victory type of deck. So again, I am interested in testing this out with uh, Tracker. So that would that would be really interesting to try. But yeah, it's very an an un an uncharacteristically fast aggressive shaper card. All right. After that, we've got a new Atom card. This is Emergent Creativity. It's a two to play, full five influence double event. Trash any number of programs or pieces of hardware from your grip. Search your stack for a program or piece of hardware and install it, lowering its install cost by the total, total install cost of the trashed card. Shuffle your stack. So this is clearly a pretty powerful tutoring card, but this isn't something you're going to put a bunch of in your decks. So you can get it early game. This is something you have one or two copies of, so you can get it late game, because the best way to use this is to have... Uh, your extra copies of stuff in your hand because you already installed the first one and then use this to chuck the extra copies and get something you do need. So like, say you you, know, you all you got three copies of your console in your deck, you already installed one of them, you draw the other two. With this, you can just toss them and go get something you do need you know, or any copies of programs you already have down. This allows you to, This allows you to chuck your extra copies and go get something you actually want. Or I'm sure what people will try to do with it is use this to try to tutor something extremely expensive. Now, I'm not an Atom player. I don't think I've ever actually tried to play Atom. So I am not versed enough in his ways to have an idea off the top of my head of what kind of nonsense you could pull out with this or what kind of hardware or programs you would try to tutor with it. But I definitely expect to see people testing it out uh, and trying to figure out like what are like either just get it for consistency to get like the last piece of your rig, or to just try to like jank combo summon something gigantic. 
So it's like, hey, mini faction, it's five influence, so this is just for Adam, and the mini factions are getting support, and that's cool. Last up for runners, we have a rare neutral program, which there are very few of those. So this is definitely this is definitely a unique thing. So we, it is called RNG key. It is zero to installed as one MU, and it is unique. Uh, it says the first time you make a successful run on HQ or RD each turn, you may name an, any number. If you do, reveal the next card that you access this run. If it has a res cost, play cost, or advancement requirement equal to the named number, either gain three credits or draw two cards. So on its face, this is like a janky goofball card where you slap it down for zero and then you just guess numbers and every now and then you'll hit and you'll get some money or some cards. And in that sense, it's probably a fun little thing to use. Uh, but you know, it's not going to be remotely competitive because you have to guess. The way to make it better, though, is to combine it with effects specifically on R&D where you get to peek at the top card of the deck. That way, again, you don't have to guess. Now, you can't really do that on HQ because you, you know, there's no top card of HQ or anything, but things like uh, spy cam effects or equivocation or Adam's find the or Adams find the truth uh, directive would all be good choices. Actually no equivocation wouldn't. Uh, equivocation wouldn't because if you peak with equivocation you then have to have the card stay there and not get the equivocation effect in order to get the RNG key effect instead. So unless the top card of was of the deck was an agenda, you wouldn't be getting the equivocation effect. So that that would not be worth it. But spy cam type effects would uh, and I think probably the best use for this would be in Adam with Adam's Find the Truth because you can uh, even if even if you only run on R and D you can have Find the Truth proc first peek at the top card of the deck know what to guess guess it and then get this effect so this yeah this is actually probably an Adam card really that's the, he's he he's by far the person most equipped to use this well and it's not a primary source of income or tempo because obviously. People like to ice HQ and R&D, so if you spend, you know, 12 credits getting through a bunch of ice so you could draw two cards, it's obviously not worth it. But I think what it can be thought of, thought of as is kind of like Takobe is a tempo-keeping card. Like, even if you have to pay a bunch of money to get through R&D, uh, this still essentially gives you a, th in Atom, this still essentially gives you a three-credit refund on your on your R and D runs once a turn, which for zero to install a three credit refund on all your R and D runs, you know, or two cards drawn if you're already rich is not bad. So I mean, yeah, I think the best the best use for this is definitely uh, find the truth with Adam, and in that case, it might actually not be bad at all. Outside of that, it's just like a fun goofy card to use, but still uh, very still interesting and a very rare neutral program. All right, then up for corpse side, let's start with HB. We have a new piece of ice. This is Night Dancer. It is a 6 to res, 4 strength code gate. It's 3 influence. It is not a bioroid. Very nice art, too, by the way. And it has two subroutines, and they are both the runner loses a click if able, and you have an additional click to spend during your next turn. So this kind of feels like a souped-up version of Hourglass, which I'm pretty sure that rotated? didn't it? Anyway, but yeah, this is just a giant click-sucking machine, and the face check value of this is substantial. Uh, if they if the runner runs into this and they're not prepared, uh, the corp gets a five-click turn. Uh, you do not want to see a corp with a five-click turn. That is not good. Now, for six to res, four strength, two subs, that's not bad numbers. I mean, it's not Fairchild three numbers, but then again, that's why that card's restricted. Uh, I don't think we're going to see a lot of this card, because uh, even for, oh no, two clicks, two clicks per second, yeah, that's, that's, actually, that's actually pretty, comparing it to like Biotic Labor, that's actually still pretty good cost. I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll see a little bit of it. You will definitely put it on your centrals, not your scoring remotes. I'm almost curious to see the value of Marcus baddying these subs. 
I'm I'm almost I'm almost curious of trying out Night Dancer plus like False Lead and Marcus Baddying the Night Dancer subs. I like I um, I almost want to try that out. Maybe someone else will. Yeah, it's definitely a nice interesting piece of ice. Uh, I don't know if it's going to see a whole lot of play, but that is definitely, because part of the effectiveness of it is like you have to have an agenda you want to score in your hand so you can fast advance it out, you know, when the runner hits this, but that's not particularly difficult to do, because uh, you could fast advance, if this if this f fires once, you can fast advance a 4-2 out of your hand, and that's pretty spiffy, so, hmm, I don't know. I don't know about this one. We'll see. After that, we've got a new upgrade. This is Jinja City Grid. It's one to res, it's five to trash. Saying that makes me nervous. Uh, it's two influence. But it's a region and it says, whenever you draw a piece of ice, you may reveal it and install it, protecting the server, lowering its install cost by four credits. So this card has one purpose, and that's saving you a buttload of money on stacking ice on one server. Uh, the and that and four minus four credits is a huge discount. You can get like a five or six ice server for basically no money with this card, and that is very very nice. Which means you can save Jesus something like fifteen credits around. But this, this card, in, in a deck with a buttload of ice that likes having gigantic servers, this is going to be a very valuable card, because it will save you a lot of money. Uh, now it's, whenever you draw the piece of ice, so, so you have to draw the card, so you have to draw the card. It won't work on stuff that's already in your hand when you put this down, which is not a big setback. However, the other much bigger setback is you have to reveal the ice. So the, so the runner knows every single piece of ice in that server af after you install this upgrade in it. There are no surprises, which is good for being able to make that gigantic of a server that easily. Uh, some of you may be saying this is a good ASA card, and it's not bad in that, but I think it's a little bit of a trap because of the way ASA works. If you have, uh, if you have this in, say, a scoring remote in ASA group, you draw the ice, you install the ice, you then have to, your ASA ability goes off, you then have to install either an either an asset or upgrade in that server or another piece of ice in that same server, and that second piece of ice does not get the discount, which, base, which isn't a huge deal, except it means that you cannot use the Jinja City grid to install a piece of ice and then install an agenda in that server and try to score out that turn because of the way the ASA group ability works. The, Ability prop can install agendas. Yeah, it's it's a little it's a little awkward to use an ASA group, but I think where we're really going to see this is in Builder, uh, or not Builder of Nations, called Architects of Tomorrow. This is a very 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 nice card in Architects of Tomorrow because it lets you save a buttload of money on installing ice, and Architects lets you save a bunch of money on resing ice, and the fact that you reveal everything doesn't really matter much to that idea anyway, because you're already resing ice on other parts of the board that the runner knows what's coming anyhow. But this, I think where this is really going to find its home is in Architects of Tomorrow, just to make giant, ridiculous late-game servers even more ridiculous, and to save you even more money setting up. So you have to spend almost nothing resing ice and almost nothing uh, installing them. So yeah, it might see a little bit of play an ASA group, but it's a, it's awkward for that, but I think this is going to be a sh really strong Architects of Tomorrow card. Alright, then for Jinteki, we've got a new Trap Ice card. This is Imor. It's zero to res, it's two influence, it's one strength, and it has one sub, and that says trash the top three cards of the stack, and then trash Imor. And just like how last pack we got Datamine 2.0 in the form of Maganga, this is of extremely similar type of card. It's very, very much data mine 2.1, I guess. Although, seeing as it only treasures card at the top of the deck, this is obviously much more specifically for like a PU type deck that cares more about milling than trying to kill the runner immediately. Uh, it still, it has the same drawbacks though. Uh, it blows up after you use it once. It also if the runner has an AI, this just doesn't go off. So again, this is, this is just a... But it's 
a slightly different data mine 2.0. This one's more suited for PU, but still pretty much copy paste what I said about Maganga last pack. See, then we've got a new 5.3 for Jinteki. This is bacterial programming. It says when it is scored or stolen, you may look at the top seven cards of R&D, add any number of them to HQ, trash any number of them, and then arrange the rest in any order. So this one's really weird. I mean, the point of it is that when someone gets it, it gives the cork a big tempo acceleration of being able to draw cards and fix your draw for the next couple turns and so on, but I mean, is that is that worth being put on a 5-3? Not really. I mean, the one thing about it is that it goes off even if the runner steals it, but like, getting to index yourself isn't really worth giving the runner three points. So... I mean, it's, it's been proven many times that for 5-3s to be playable, they almost have to be self-defending or have some ridiculously powerful ability on them, but this is... Uh, it's, it's, it's not enough. No, I'm not, no one's going to play this. All right, then for yellow cards, we have a new Sentry Ice. This is Jua. It's... Two influence, really shiny there, I think it's a two. Uh, two to res, three strength. Choose two installed runner cards. If able, the runner must add one of those cards to the top of the stack, but it also has an encounter effect that when the runner encounters it, they cannot install cards for the remainder of the turn. So what I'm starting to notice with uh, Boggs's idea of NBN is that he very much seems to be leaning NBN into the direction of uh, tempo hits. Because, to, to be fair, tags are more or less like a tempo war, because it costs you, mo it costs you money and clicks to get rid of them. So, with things, um, so what we're seeing now is a lot of uh, bounce stuff back to the runner's hand, bounce stuff back on the top of their deck, uh, prevent them from installing cards. We're seeing yellow as a lot of, like, to a lot of a lot of tempo inhibiting cards in yellow, which is probably the right way to go with it. I mean, again, as we all know, I despise yellow, but it does make sense uh, to make yellow very, very tempo manipulating and have a lot of things that just slow the runner down. Uh, now, the two to res three strength one sub sentry; those aren't bad numbers. The Subroutine, choose two cards. The runner has to add one of them back on top of their deck. The runner does get to choose which one, and that's not good, but you do get to pick two of them. So, I mean, there's... Both both the runner and the corp get some degree of control of that, but then, it would, of course, as always, it depends on what's on the runner's field. So if it, if it, was, just, if it was just the subroutine, I probably wouldn't think very much of this card. Uh, but the encounter effect is what has me interested. When the runner encounters it, they cannot install cards for the rest of the turn. So obviously the earlier in the game that the runner runs into this, the more it's going to hurt them. If they're already set up, who cares? But I'm actually kind of interested how useful that encounter effect is going to be. Because uh, you can definitely uh, make them like unable to install you can make them unable to install programs and resources and stuff after their turn so if you can bait them into early runs you can make them you know have to spend their clicks doing other stuff that they weren't planning on doing if i understand the encounter rules correctly if a runner has smc out and uh, runs into this they can't pop the smc or they can't uh, put out their heat breakers if if I remember the encounter rules right, I might need to I might need to look that up. Correct me on that if I'm wrong. But yeah, this is this is this is one I'm kind of on the fence on, uh, and it's 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 really how useful is that encounter effect will decide how good this ice is. It might be better than you think for like a strong like early game rush, early game, you know, take the tempo and run with it kind of deck, which seems to be where they're pushing they're pushing yellow to, which again sounds. It sounds like that makes sense, so we'll we'll see. 
All right, after that for NBN, we have the yellow reprisal card. Remember how we had wake up call as the first reprisal last pack? Now we've got NBN's reprisal. This is threat assessment. It's one to play, it's three influence. Play only if the runner trashed at least one corp card during his or her last turn. Choose an installed runner card. The runner must either add that card to the top of the stack or take two tags. Remove threat assessment from the game instead of trashing it. Okay, so if this is any indication of how the reprisal cards are going to work, they're all pretty much, if the runner tried to trash your stuff last turn, you give them a choice of either lose a significant amount of tempo and setup or get foobard. So, whereas Wake Up Call was blow something up in return or take a buttload of damage, this is bounce a card back to the top of your deck or take two tags. Now, this is not a terminal or a double, so what this means is you can play this turn one, and the runner has the choice of having two tags on the corpse turn, which is a big fat no-no. If you've played runner for more than 12 seconds, you know that having two tags on the corpse turn is bad, 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 McNasty face. Don't ever let that happen, ever. They can boom you, they can close accounts, they can exchange of information, they can do pretty much whatever the hell they want to you. So when you, when you play this, you will almost guaranteedly always get the other effect. Like, whereas Wake Up, wake up Call, you could go either way. I've tried using Wake Up Call, and it is very dependent on the runner's board state, uh, and it also, as long as they have four damage to take, it's really up it's really up to the runner whether to take the damage or keep that important thing this one you will all this one you play this you will almost always get the other effect this will almost always result in the runner just letting you bounce something to the top of their deck because nobody will even risk the chance of you having boom in your hand to follow this up with or whatever else this will this will almost this will almost always get you the bounce effect so in that way it's arguably a lot more consistent of an effect than Wake Up Call, but there's also the argument of like how useful is that effect going to be? Again, very dependent on the runner's board state. However, there are some there are definitely some choice targets for this. Uh, if they're hosting anything on anything else, like if they have, you know, a, a Mopus on a Dehegdir, you can bounce the Dehegdir and Mopus just gets trashed. If they've uh, got a turning wheel with a bajillion counters on it, uh, that will get bounced and they'll lose all the counters. If they've got, if they're at full MU and they have a console out, you bounce the console and they have to, and they they have to trash some of their programs. I mean, those aren't going to happen all the time. I mean, they could have something as simple as like you know a liberated account. They just haven't taken money off of yet. It's iffy. This so this this one's a little up in the air. I mean, it like like the last one, like Wake Up Call. It is very dependent on what the runner's board state is at the time. But this is arguably a lot more consistent and reliable than Wake Up Call was. Because, like I said, absolutely no one wants to have two tags on the runner's turn, or on the, corp, on the corpse turn. So, I don't know, I'm not sure if this will see more or less play than Wake Up Call, but we'll, but we'll see. Alright, after that for Wayland, we have a new operation. This is Economic Warfare. It's zero to play, it's two influence, and it says play only if the runner made a successful run during their last turn. The runner loses four credits if able. And, oof, this is... This is a scarier card than I think people give it credit for. I mean, it's simple, it's straightforward, and it is nasty. Like... Obviously, the combo synergy with this is to uh, use this right before playing, like, a hard-hitting news or a sea source or something like that. So you make the runner lose a bunch of credits, then you do a trace. So it can definitely screw with the runner's math on whether or not they're safe from getting hard-hitting newsed. Uh, but even without that, it can just be a really annoying card. Runner just out of nowhere just loses four credits. Like, it can definitely mess with the runner's expectations of you know, how their tempo is. Because all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can do, I can make this run and I can still have five credits left to, you know, play sure gamble. Oh, wait, now I have to spend a turn clicking for credits. You know, so in this, and you can just keep, you know, shuffling this back into your deck if you want and just, this can, this can be a really irritating card.
So even if you don't combo it with hard hitting news and whatnot, this can still just be a really, really annoying card for the runner to deal with. Uh, probably best in things like uh, rush decks, just to you know help put even more pressure on the runner, because for a single click, the runner loses four credits, so this could probably be good in a rush deck. This is probably a really good uh, spark card, because spark is all about just draining the runner of credits. So this is probably really good in that. Uh, I mean, it's... There's not a ton to say about it. It's a, it's a simple, straightforward card, but this is I, I imagine this is going to piss me off to no end when people in my group start playing it, but realistically, I'm not expecting to see it that much. But I'm sure the one person who decides to put three of these in their deck is going to drive their opponents up the wall with it. After that, we've got Forced Connection, which is a upgrade. It's an ambush. It's zero to res, zero to trash. It says, if it's accessed from R&D, the runner must reveal it. When the runner accesses it, trace three. If successful, give the runner two tags. Ignore this ability if the runner accesses it from archives. So this is kind of like a Wayland version of Shock or Breach to Dome, in which case, well, it, get, it those work in archives. This doesn't work in archives, but this is also an upgrade that can be installed in a server along with an asset or agenda. So there's a plus there and a minus there. Uh, most of the time, well let's let's be real here, most of the time what this is going to read is when the runner touches it they lose three credits because fighting the trace three is going to be way easier than removing two tags and especially if they don't have two, two clicks left to remove the two tags then they absolutely want to just fight the trace. So most of the times is just going to read like when the runner touches it they lose three credits. Unless you as the corp have a big economy lead, in which case you actually want to dump money into the trace fight. So I don't know how much play this is going to see. I think it might have a place in somewhere like maybe a making news deck or in the uh, tag stacking upgrade hell Argus type decks where you put like price X and KP lens and then this all dumped onto one server. It could it could have a place in those like nest style decks. Uh, outside of that, I'm probably not going to see it a lot, but it is interesting to see like a Wayland ambush trap. All right, then this pack goes ahead and gives us not one, not two, but three neutral corp cards. The first of which has Sunny's logo stamped right on the front. This is a 5-3 agenda SSL endorsement. It's no influence, and it says. When it is scored or stolen, place nine credits on it. When the corpse turn begins, they may take three credits from it. This ability is active even while it's in the runner's score area. So if anybody thought that they wanted a 5-3 version of corporate sales team, guess what? You got it. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, the, obviously the biggest point about this is that you still get the nine credits as the corp even when the runner steals it. And that's really nice. So, and I wouldn't exactly call it a defensive effect, but it is still pretty cool. I would definitely say this is better than bacterial programming. And now the biggest the biggest issue with this is it's a neutral 5-3 that competes for agenda space with Global Food Initiative. So, I mean, because of that alone, I'm not expecting to see a ton of it, but in any deck where you want five threes but aren't willing to spend the influence and the restricted slot on Global Food Initiative, this would definitely be the go-to agenda to use instead of Global Food. Yeah, I think, I like it. I actually like it. If, if Just the fact that Global Food exists will probably be the biggest reason you don't see a ton of it, but if you want five threes and don't have and aren't using food, this is definitely a prime candidate. So I personally, I like this one a lot. After that, we've got a seemingly innocuous card called NGO Front. And this is a neutral asset. It's zero influence. It's zero to res. It's one to trash. It can be advanced. And it says trash, one hosted advancement token, gain five credits. And trash, two hosted advancement tokens, gain eight credits. And the thing is, at first, you might just ignore this card, seeing it as like, you know, some knockoff version of Melange Mining Corp or something like that. But this is 
in my opinion, one of the rudest corp cards that we've seen recently, because what this is is not primarily an economy tool. I mean, it is that, but what this really is is a uh, never advance bait. Or yeah, it's not never advance bait, but like advancement pretend it's an agenda bait. Because what you get to do with this, like just, just using it purely for money, you can install advance, pop it, gain five, which you paid one to advancement, so it's a net four. For two credits, it's, for two clicks, it's a net four credits, so it's two credits a click. Same thing when you with two advancement tokens. It's you spend yeah, you get you spend two to advance it, you gain eight. So for three clicks you gain six credits. It's two it's two credits a click either way, so it's kind of like a little rentum opus thing. But the big use for this is you put this in a server and you pretend it's an agenda. So what this this what this card does, like I install advance I get you six say you like get to game point five points, you install advance, advance this, the runner has to come get it. They spend a bunch of time and money getting through your server, and then before they even get to access it, you just res it, pop it, and gain eight, gain eight credits. And the runner just gets to feel like an ass for the next couple turns, because, like, yeah, the, the fact that you can do that, that's what it's for, is just pretend it's an agenda and the runner goes for it, and then when they get to it, you just trash it and gain a bunch of money. So it, it creates... You know, you gaining eight when the runner loses, you know, God knows how much to get into that server can just be absolutely demoralizing and just give the court player the ability to sit there with a giant shit-eating grin on their face. This is, this is absolutely like one of the rudest corp cards that I've seen recently. Now, do I expect to see a ton of it? Probably not. But, I mean, there's decks where you would... Uh, try to put in like the singleton June bug or something like that, and as fun as that is, unless it kills the runner, it's just annoying. Uh, so the, I would put I would take out the June bugs and put this in there instead for those type of decks, or even just if you're running just like a straightforward rush deck or a straightforward glacier deck, like this is not a bad idea to put one or two of these in here just to bait the runner into you know a huge tempo swing in the corpse favor. Like this, I'm probably, I'm not expecting to see a lot of it, but trust me, when you get tricked into going after this as the runner, you will feel like a heel when, the, when you get tricked into going after this and you just handed the corp a bunch of money. So yeah, don't, don't underestimate this. And finally bringing up the rear for this pack is Distract the Masses. This is a zero influence, zero to play operation. The runner gains two credits. Trash up to two cards from HQ, then shuffle up to two cards from archives into R&D. Remove distract from the masses from the game instead of trashing it. So clearly this is yet another card in the ever-growing list of cards trying to be the new Jackson Howard. And honestly, this one's not bad. I mean, I think, I think you know, we've all settled on preemptive action to be our new Jackson Howard replacement, for the most part. Uh, genotyping wasn't bad. This one uh, is interesting in the fact that, I mean, the runner the runner gains two credits, and that makes people makes a lot of people probably turn away from it. Uh, but the big advantage of this one that the other Jackson replacements didn't have is that this allows you to shuffle agendas out of your hand and get agenda flood fixed without the agendas ever hitting the bin. Okay, I guess okay, I guess they technically hit the bin, but you know what I mean. The runner never has a chance to run archives and steal them. It's like preemptive action, you have to leave the agendas in your archives for at least one turn, which means there's a risk that the agenda could that the, that the runner could go steal the agendas. You know, genotyping, they had to just be there beforehand or they're the two you mailed, whatever. Uh, this one, it's like, yeah, it's it's not as good for shuffling things back into your deck like preemptive action is, but this this one is very specifically to recreate the Jackson Howard effect of I fix agenda flood without the runner ever having a real chance to steal the agendas that are flooding my hand. And, you know, for the strength of that effect, the runner gaining two credits, that's a that's a pittance to pay for that kind of safety of dealing with Agenda Flood. So with this added to the game, when you build a corp deck, you now have a question about what you're going to do with your uh, Jackson Howard type card. Because if, if you want 
uh, preemptive action. Preemptive action, besides getting agendas back in the deck, also just helps you shuffle copies of cards you spent back into the deck. This is specifically for fixing agenda flood. So if you're running like a deck that goes into the long game that wants to play a certain card over and over again, go for preemptive action. If you're playing like a faster, more aggressive deck where like you're probably not going to get through most of your deck, you're just trying to end the game quickly for whatever reason, this game, this one could be worth a lot more because this one just plan fixes agenda flood without any risk of the runner stealing the agendas you had to toss earlier on. So it's kind of, so yeah, it's kind of like they took it's kind of like they split Jackson Howard's two biggest points into two separate cards. You know, the shuffle things back into the deck and the complete safety of the runner never having to steal. It's kind of like it's kind of like they split them into two different halves. So when you're building a corp deck, you pick which half is more important to you. So yeah, in in that in that respect, uh, I th- I think I think it's a good I think it's a good play I think it's a th- good thing to add to the game and when you build a corp deck you now have a real decision to make and you uh, don't don't just brush this card off because it says the runner gains two credits on it this this could be worth it in any kind of like fast deck where you just where you just want to deal with agenda flood rather than having to toss stuff and then shuffle it back in later. Anywho, that is pack two of the Katara cycle and. Well, I can think we can ag- we can agree there's not a ton of like big hard hitting cards in this pack. However, there are a lot of cards that are seemingly preparing for other cards and strategies down the road. So, what I think we're seeing this we're getting a little bit more of a view of how the cycle is going to play out and what you know Boggs and crew have in plans have have planned in store for us. So I think there's going to be a lot of cards and a lot of cards in these first couple packs that will gradually become more and more useful as other support cards that work with, with them come out later. So we'll see, but as always, good to see new cards and thank you and good night. I'm a